Hello, today I'm going to talk about the choice of a GnRH agonist or antagonist for uh, ovarian stimulation in IVF. Now I'm old enough to remember when the GnRH agonist was first introduced. This was by uh, Richard Fleming's uh, group from Glasgow and uh, also by Rick Porter and uh, Howard Jacobs in London. And this really was a, a revolution uh, in IVF. Previously we'd been troubled by uh, premature luteinization and cancellation of cycles and poorer results. So the inception of the agonist uh, was a big deal for IVF. The antagonist took years to uh, develop by the various drug companies and even when it was perfected and introduced into the market it was extremely slow to be accepted and the main reason for this was that we were getting poorer results with the antagonist than we were with the agonist so many centers were uh, reluctant to change now this has all changed it's been a long learning curve but as from uh, a large Cochrane review in 2011, then it was quite plain that the antagonist is producing the same, if not better, results than the agonist itself. So today, I believe that almost all cycles in IVF, we should be using a GnRH antagonist. And the reasons, I think, are quite clear. One, we need to use less gonadotrophins. Two, using an antagonist will always be a, a shorter cycle and that of course is uh, much better for the, uh, the patients. Uh, it makes them feel much more comfortable uh, rather than a, a minimum six week cycle uh, using the agonist. The fact that we use uh, less gonadotrophins, this is number three, uh, means there is much less chance of uh, ovarian hyperstimulation uh, using the antagonist rather than the agonist. And finally, and most importantly, use of the antagonist uh, allows the use of a GnRH agonist uh, for triggering ovulation. And this has considerably reduced uh, the number of cases of ovarian hyperstimulation uh, that we have. This, I think, has been a, a really important step forward and we should all really now uh, aiming for having a clinic which is OHSS free. So, I hope if you are still routinely using the GnRH agonist uh, for your IVF cycles, maybe after what you've heard today you'll think again and convert onto the antagonist. Thank you. Roy, um, there has been a huge amount of debate on pretreatment with the oral contraceptive pill or with the Proganova. Mm -hmm. I believe you are the, one of the first to do the trial on looking at hormonal levels and synchronization using the pill and stopping and could you briefly explain uh, the benefits of uh, doing pretreatment and why we should stop it after uh, start the stimulation after two days of stopping the pretreatment? Yes, sure. Well, one of the reasons why the uh, antagonist was slow to be accepted was the fact that it was more difficult to program uh, the IVF uh, the uh, uh, egg collections uh, and the embryo transfers using the antagonist. Uh, but this I think we have overcome completely by giving pretreatment with either estrogens uh, or the pill and of course I'm, I'm a firm believer in this. It helps us to program. It also uh, allows a certain amount of uh, down regulation uh, but I don't think this is, is the main factor. What is important, I think, to know is that when the down regulation or the uh, pill or the estrogen is stopped, uh, then you should start stimulation two days after stopping 
uh, this pretreatment, and this will allow you a much better synchronization of the follicles. Would be more uniform. Yeah. Because sometimes when uh, uh, when this is what I was talking about yeah. synchronization, synchronization of the follicles. So that's the only uniform, mm. yeah, and I and I believe so that that's good. But again, it is believed that. Uh, some people and some studies have come up in solo where they have looked at pretreatment and synchronization and they believe that the eventual results in a fresh cycle are lower in terms of pregnancy rate than not. That's what Kolibanakis' trial uh, McDonald's is suggesting. Yes, yeah. This has been repeated in the meantime and very few people have found the same and now finding quite equal results and finding it much more convenient because they can plan out the cycles. Now, no. I am for, I'm for pre-treatment, particularly when I'm looking at some patients like PCO, where I would get one cohort which is high or low, or, or those especially who are in the higher age group sometimes, because again, uh, sometimes there is follicular recruitment and the baseline one or two follicles are a bigger size and then they, they rise faster in the lower cohorts. Low, so that's why I just feel it works well, yeah. at least in those subgroups for me. But, but again, I think all the trials which were done, were done, uh, in, including the meta-analysis, was done with the oral contraceptive pill. There have been yes. none d done and, with the program. And they all excluded PCO, yes. which I think is probably the, one of the main indications uh, for giving pretreatment. Uh, I, I think it, if there is a, if there are patients who are PCO or have a large antral follicle count or in the borderline, I think it is it will be considered a negligent to put them on the long protocol. And in a modern context where you have the risk of overstimulation, I think at the present time, though you cannot have a completely OHSS free clinic, I think we, if you willingly put somebody on the long protocol with bad PCOS, and the patient goes into a hyperstimulation, I think there is very little to defend. Yeah, I think negligence may be a strong word, but I agree with you. <laughs>